Okay, drugs for urinary system. We're going to talk about uh, lower urinary tract uh, infections. Uh, this would be just of the bladder um, and the urethra. Uh, not talking about poly uh, pyelonephritis or anything like that. And uh, a little bit about overactive bladder disease. So phosphomycin is um, uh, kind of its own class of antibiotic. Uh, it inhibits bacterial cell wall synthesis and keeps the bacteria from sticking to the mucosal uh, membrane of the bladder, uh, the ureters, and the urethra. The advantage is that it's usually a single dose treatment to be taken with or without food. It should always be mixed with water. It comes in a powder form. The powder itself should never be taken alone. It should always be mixed with three or four ounces of water uh, and drink. Uh, common side effects, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal cramping, and flatulence. Uh, severe adverse reactions, uh, perineal burning, and dysuria. Uh, this could be a result of the UTI. Uh, it could be... Um, a side effect of the medication. So if not resolved in two to three days, then they should contact their health care provider. Uh, methanamine uh, is an interesting drug. Uh, it inhibits uh, enzymes that are needed for, oh that's not true, um, looking at the wrong um, uh, drug. Sorry about that. Um, but what's interesting about uh, methanamine is that it actually forms formaldehyde uh, in the bladder in the presence of acidic urine and that's how it suppresses growth of the bacteria. It's used to treat uh, or actually to prevent uh, recurrent UTIs. It doesn't treat an active uh, infection. So the current infection needs to be cleared um, and then methanamine can be started to prevent uh, another um, UTI from happening. Common side effects, nausea, vomiting, belching. Um, serious side effects, uh, hives, itching, rash. Um, these can be symptoms of uh, allergic reaction. Bladder irritation and dysuria and frequency can be the symptoms of the UTI or it can be indicators of irritation by the medication. So again, if um, doesn't resolve in two or three days, then the health care provider should be notified. Um, uh, methanamine or uh, mandelamine is really two medications uh, combined. Uh, one is the methanamine that forms formaldehyde and the other uh, is a medication that uh, causes the urine to be acidic. Um, so if methanamine is given alone, then we want to uh, encourage the patient to take in uh, extra vitamin C because that will also make the urine acidic. Teach the patient to, that it can be taken with food, that it needs to be taken four uh, times a day, uh, that they should not crush or chew the tablet uh, because that causes formaldehyde to form in the stomach which is going to increase the nausea and uh, belching. Because they will be on this medication chronically, they may need to be taught to test their urine pH to make sure that it's below 5.5. Nitroferentoin. Um, most of us are familiar with macrodantin, um, macrobid. Um, Nitroferantoin uh, interferes with uh, 
the several uh, enzyme systems that are needed for replication or growth of the bacteria. It's only used for treatment of UTIs. Uh, it has no effectiveness on anything else. Uh, it can uh, be taken with food or milk, uh, especially if GI symptoms um, occur. Uh, nausea, vomiting, anorexia are common side effects. Uh, urine discoloration is also co common. It can uh, turn the urine uh, a brighter yellow uh, or anywhere to a rust uh, brown. So patients need to know that the urine will change color and that this is expected and harmless. Um, serious adverse effects, dyspnea, chills, fever, rash, pruritus, obviously these are symptoms of an allergy. Um, typically it will occur within eight hours if they've taken um, uh, nitrofurantoin before and can be as late as seven to ten days uh, if the allergy occurs during the current course of medication therapy. Uh, Nitrofurantoin should not be used for patients who are in renal failure. Uh, patients should be told not to take magnesium antacids uh, because it uh, prevents it from working well. We also want patients to report uh, any numbness or tingling. Uh, if they begin to experience this, uh, then they need to DC the medication. Um, and burning or irritation would most likely be an indicator of uh, continued or secondary infection. Uh, overactive bladder, um, frequently anticholinergics um, can be used. Uh, they block the cholinergic receptors, causing the bladder to uh, relax. Uh, typically, um, overactive bladder disease has three primary symptoms, frequency, urgency, uh, and incontinence as a result of spasming of the bladder. So the anticholinergic agents are frequently called urinary antispasmodics. So we use it for overactive bladder disease with the desired therapeutic effect being reducing the urgency and frequency of the bladder contractions. Common adverse effects, of course, are going to be those associated with the fact that it's an anticholinergic. So dry mouth, urinary hesitancy, uh, retention, constipation because it does have some uh, effect on the bowel as well. Uh, blurred vision. Uh, you probably remember that we don't use anticholinergic agents with uh, patients with glaucoma, uh, urinary retention, uh, especially obstructive urinary retention, and um, bowel disease. Serious side effects would be that if any of the um, common side effects became more uh, severe. Bethenicol um, is a cholinergic agent. Uh, it stimulates the parasympathetic nerves uh, in the bladder. Um, allowing for re restoration of bladder tone and urination. Okay, you can tell me later. You guys need to go out, please. Um, Anyway, it's used for non-obstructive uh, urinary retention. Uh, keep in mind, because it, it is stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system, that it's also going to stimulate uh, gastric motility, uh, increase gastric tone, 
uh, restore uh, peristalsis. Um, so uh, GI side effects are going to be expected. Um, it can cause flushing of the skin and a headache uh, because of a vasodilating property of this medication. Um, and other symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, sweating, abdominal pain, cramping, diarrhea, belching, and involuntary uh, defecation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on neostigmine. It isn't even in your book. Um, but neostigmine, um, we actually use for... Um, not multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, um, because uh, it does block cholinesterase, um, so it prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine, which is the primary uh, problem with um, myasthenia gravis. Uh, it's primarily used to uh, prevent or treat post-operative bladder distension, and uh, if you um, it uh, can uh, increase secretions. Um, it helps patients with um, uh, swallowing uh, when they when they have myasthenia gravis. Um, so anyway, uh, just kind of an FYI. Anybody who had a bladder infection is probably familiar with peridium or phenazopyridine hydrochloride. Uh, it is not an antibiotic or antimicrobial. Uh, it is a urinary tract anesthetic um, and so it pr provides for pain relief uh, and that's the, the primary reason. Uh, by reducing discomfort we can also reduce urgency and frequency. Uh, it does cause the urine to change color uh, however, it also causes um, many secretions uh, to change color, and it can, um, you know, cause tears, and so it can affect the uh, contact lenses. Um, <laughs> so patients should know um, about that. Uh, they do need to watch and make sure that their skin and their sclera uh, do not change color. And if they notice a change in skin or sclera, then they should seek medical help. Okay, we're talking about uh, muscle disorders, primarily uh, spasms uh, and spasticity. Uh, keep in mind that these are not um, exactly the same thing. Um, spasms are um, a tightening and re relaxing, you know, the, the, the muscle group uh, tightens all of a sudden uh, versus spasticity where the muscles become stiff. Um, they may have spasming along with it, but the stiffness of the muscles is going to change um, joint function and uh, everything about their mobility. Typically when we think of muscle spasms, uh, especially that causes alteration in activities of daily living, you know, we're thinking about uh, muscle spasm in the back. You know, spasm can, can occur anywhere um, and they can occur over a long period of time, uh, but as a general rule, the cause of any skeletal problems related to a spasm is the way that we adapt to prevent the spasms, so you know, holding ourselves in a certain position or um, avoiding doing certain activities. Whereas with spasticity, uh, the muscles become stiffer and stiffer over time, so that mobility uh, becomes limited or absent uh, because there is no function uh, of the muscle. These muscles could still spasm. Um, and cause more discomfort, uh, but uh, it's just um, 
a different uh, pathology. Typically, we see spasticity with um, brain injuries, strokes, cerebral palsy, um, Parkinson's, um, multiple sclerosis uh, becomes a little bit spastic as well. <clears throat> so centrally acting uh, skeletal muscle relaxants, this means that they uh, act on the brain and they depress the central nervous system. Um, they don't have a direct effect on skeletal muscles and the um, action isn't exactly known, but most people feel like it's the sedative effect uh, rather than actually uh, relaxing the muscles. Um, the example, the, the probably the most well-known, is cyclobenzaprine or flexoril, usually used in combination with physical therapy, rest, and analgesics uh, to relieve the muscle spasms. It should not be used for muscle spasticity uh, associated with spinal cord or cerebral disease. So um, someone who has had a stroke or cerebral palsy, a spinal cord injury that develops spasticity should not be given a centrally acting muscle relaxant because it can uh, actually make the spasticity worse and cause further uh, impairment. Common side effects obviously are sedation uh, because it's a central nervous system depressant. Um, weakness, lethargy are also common. GI complaints are not an unusual uh, side effect. Uh, however, it is something that um, should be reported for further evaluation. Serious side effects include uh, hepatotoxicity um, remember what the uh, symptoms of hepatotoxicity are, uh, anorexia, um, abdominal pain, late symptoms would be jaundice, uh, blood dyscrasias, uh, you know, an alteration in uh, white count, red count, platelet count, so all the things we would look for uh, there. Uh, tiredness not explained by side effects of the med, pallor, uh, frequent infections, uh, easy bleeding, all of those things might indicate a blood dyscrasia. Uh, obviously patient teaching uh, is going to include not taking it with additional central nervous system uh, depressants such as alcohol, um, sleep aids, that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, you know, along with treatment for, um, you know, uh, alternative treatments, I guess, for the, the spasm uh, itself, such as, you know, heat, um, cold, stretching, you know, whatever uh, that might be. Another centrally acting muscle cell, uh, skeletal muscle relaxant is baclofen. Um, it actually interrupts reflexes uh, at the level of the spinal cord. So it uh, prevents the signal from transferring back and forth, telling the muscle to uh, spasm. Um, it can be used for spasticity. Uh, and it's really primarily used for spasticity as opposed to uh, just muscle spasms, um, unless they're relatively severe. severe. Um, but it can be used for multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injuries, uh, cerebral palsy. Frequently when it's used for cerebral palsy, it's given intrathecally, uh, which means it's given directly into the um, fluid, the spinal fluid rather than IV or, or IM. 
it should not excuse me should not be used with um, spasticities unrelated to the central nervous system uh, um, in such as uh, it should not be used with Parkinson's or strokes uh, or rheumatoid uh, rheumatic disorders that affect uh, muscles and become spastic. Uh, the cause of those um, is different than a spinal cord injury or a traumatic uh, brain injury. Um, I know you're thinking a stroke is a pretty traumatic brain injury, but it's not necessarily the same. Um, Anyway, this can it, it, using baclofen with those disorders uh, can uh, cause more problems. <clears throat> Common uh, side effects would include nausea, fatigue, headache, uh, drowsiness, dizziness. Of course, we're going to want to be concerned about um, patient safety uh, with drowsiness and dizziness, and uh, teach patients or their caregivers. Uh, that the um, addition of other types of CNS depressants um, may cause uh, more sedation uh, or worsening of um, symptoms of spasticity. One of the things that we want to be uh, aware of um, with baclofen uh, is uh, that it, you know, can cause respiratory distress in, in higher doses, and we want to be sure that the dosage is appropriate. Dantrolene is a uh, direct acting skeletal muscle relaxant. Uh, it produces uh, a generalized weakness of skeletal muscles and decreases the force of the muscle contraction. So when the, the signal comes back to the muscle, <clears throat> it can't uh, spasm uh, as forcefully. Uh, it can control spasticity of chronic disorders like cerebral palsy, um, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, and stroke uh, syndrome. <clears throat> uh, it can also be used to treat neuroleptic malignant syndrome uh, that is associated with the use of antipsychotic agents and um, unusual reactions to anesthesia. A patient doesn't come out of uh, anesthesia. Um, it seems uh, that uh, contradictory. Uh, they're obviously already um, distraught or, you know, too relaxed, you think. Um, but it has a uh, counteractive effect for, for types, some types of anesthesia. Uh, common side effects, weakness, obviously, I mean, that's how it, it uh, works. Drowsiness, dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, diarrhea. Most of these are, are mild uh, and self-resolving, especially if the medication is started at a low dose and uh, gradually increased. Serious adverse effects are going to be photosensitivity and hepatotoxicity. So patient teaching is going to include symptoms of hepatotoxicity and uh, care of the skin. So making sure that they're avoiding sun exposure, uh, that they're using sunscreen, wearing long sleeves, uh, things like that. <clears throat> now neuromuscular blocking agents like succinylcholine, uh, actually interrupt the transmission of impulses uh, from motor nerves to the muscles. Um, so there's no communication. Uh, without communication, then 
uh, the muscles aren't going to move. Um, it not only affects skeletal muscles, but also uh, smooth muscles. So we frequently um, have to be concerned with uh, respiratory depression uh, more with a neuromuscular blocking agent than with any of the others that we've talked about. Uh, anytime you have CNS depression, you risk respiratory depression. Uh, but this is more than uh, just making a person too sleepy to breathe. Uh, it actually um, prevents the signal that those muscles need to work uh, from getting through. The interesting thing I think about uh, the neuromuscular blocking agents is that they have no effect on consciousness, memory, or pain. Uh, when a patient is given succinicoline, uh, if they were to be given it alone, and it, and it usually is administered um, as an adjuvant therapy to uh, anesthesia, um, but if they were given it al um, alone, then they would still be alert. Um, they would still be aware of their surroundings. They would remember what was going on, and they would feel pain though they would be unable to um, communicate in any way uh, that they knew what was going on or, or that they were in pain. So pain becomes um, a, an assessment that we have to really be aware of um, and just assume that if uh, they can be given something for pain that they probably uh, are going to need it until the effects of that medication uh, wear off. Um, so they, um, so anyway, just uh, need to be aware of that. Um, succinicoline is a, is a favorite of, uh, of serial killers everywhere. Uh, there's nothing better than being able to torture your patient, your per your victim, <laughs> not your patient. That was a, that was a Freudian slip. Um, torture your your victim and know that that they're experiencing everything and um, so just something to keep it in the back of your mind uh, you never know when you might need to know that so uh, why is it used it's used to uh, reduce the uh, amount of general anesthetic uh, that would be used or needed um, it can be used with uh, um, so that it's easier to uh, insert an ET tube um, so that the spasms of, a, of electric shock therapy are less and um, to decrease muscle spasms associated with tetanus. Um, some of the, the side effects are related to the fact that succinicoline causes histamine release. Uh, and this histamine release can cause bronchospasm, uh, significant increase in secretions, uh, both salivary and bronchial. Uh, it causes vasodilation, uh, which can cause flushing um, and drop in blood pressure. Uh, so we can see edema as a result of the vasodilation and um, hives or urticaria are common as well. Uh, it decreases the cough reflex and uh, can cause impaired swallowing. So we definitely need to watch closely for signs of respiratory failure and um, always have suction available and be aware that uh, we, we need to um, encourage uh, coughing and deep breathing as much as the patient can until that medication uh, has worn off. You know, obviously if they have a large dose on, they're not going to be able to cough, but that's um, usually not when we're going to be seeing it unless we work in the OR. Now gout, um, gout is a buildup of uric acid crystals in joints and the surrounding tissues causing pain and inflammation. 
Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of meds that are used to treat gout. Uh, allopurinol um, inhibits the enzyme xanthine oxidase, uh, which prevents the formation of uric acid. It can be given PO or IV. Uh, it can be taken with food or milk. Uh, they do need to make sure they drink plenty of fluids uh, in order to flush um, the uric acid out of their system. Occasionally, when people first start on allopurinol, the attacks get worse uh, before they get better. Side effects are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, he uh, headache, uh, hepatotoxicity, blood dyscrasias, and hypersensitivity. Lots of drug interactions, so we would want to uh, review that um, when the patient first starts on uh, the medication. Colchicine uh, interrupts the cycle of uric crystal deposition. It doesn't affect the amount of uric acid in the blood. It doesn't prevent the uric acid from being made. Uh, it simply prevents it from depositing uh, in the tissues. Um, for that reason, we've got uh, uric acid crystals um, or uric acid buildup. Um, you know, it's not going to be decreased. And so we really want to make sure that they're drinking a lot, that they have adequate renal function um, in order to uh, rid themselves of those uric crystals. Uh, it shouldn't be used in those with renal, cardiac, or GI dysfunction. Um, if, unlike with allopurinol, um, if nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea develop, then therapy should be stopped. Um, this is a sign of, of toxicity, and so we wouldn't uh, consider that a, a common uh, side effect. Uh, blood dyscrasias are um, an adverse effect as well. Uh, probably the biggest benefit for colchicine is that uh, it doesn't really interact with anything else. Okay. Thanks for listening. Okay, we're talking about eye disorders. Uh, primarily, this is uh, glaucoma. Um, if you're not remembering glaucoma, you might want to review that uh, process. Um, understanding the flow of aqueous humor, uh, the types of glaucoma, um, how dilation uh, of the pupil or uh, constriction of the pupil um, affects uh, glaucoma. Uh, Medriasis is dilation and meiosis is constriction of the pupil. Uh, a cycloplegic drug relaxes the muscle uh, of the eye. Uh, those are uh, terms that you might want to uh, know. Um, so again, uh, we can use uh, cycloplegics and midriatics primarily to look into the eye. Um, anticholinergics uh, are midriatics that are used to uh, dilate the pupils for eye examinations. And uh, cholinergics can produce unfavorable side effects. And uh, those are some of the drugs we're going to talk about. Osmotic agents, uh, if you remember what an osmotic uh, agent is, it is something that's going to pull fluid. So osmotic agents reduce volume of the intraocular fluid by increasing plasma osmolarity, meaning that uh, it causes fluid shifts uh, by making it uh, essentially more 
um, have more electrolytes or whatever uh, to move, cause that fluid to move. Um, so it can be used to reduce intraocular pressure in patients with acute narrow angle glaucoma. Uh, not typically used for chronic uh, open angle glaucoma. Side effects include uh, thirst, nausea, dehydration, uh, electrolyte imbalance, primarily potassium, sodium, and chloride. Uh, headache as a result of cerebral dehydration so it's often uh, useful to keep the patient uh, flat. Um, circulatory overload uh, can occur, so bounding pulses, uh, pulmonary edema, these are things that we would want to watch for. Um, mannitol is the uh, mainly the drug that we're talking about. Uh, it can be used for reduction of intraocular pressure. It could be given IV orally or topically. Um, should not be given or should be used carefully in patients taking lithium uh, because it can reduce lithium levels, causing the excretion of lithium. Uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, we, you might remember these from uh, when we talked about diuretics. Uh, because they are a diuretic, but they typically are used for um, removal of systemic fluid. Uh, they are useful, however, in uh, controlling intraocular pressure, typically used with other medications uh, rather than just alone. Um, because they're an inhibitor, uh, they inhibit an enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, uh, that which results in the reduction in the production of aqueous humor. Uh, they can cause electrolyte imbalances. Uh, rarely they will have a diuretic effect on someone and cause an electrolyte imbalance dehydration. Uh, they can cause uh, alterations in skin. Uh, the hematologic makeup they can cause neurologic reactions, confusion, and drowsiness. They can be given PO or intraocularly, and as a general rule, should not be given to patients who are allergic to sulfa drugs. Cholinergic agents uh, produce contraction of the iris and ciliary body, uh, resulting in meiosis. Or meiosis is constriction of the pupil. And if you remember um, about uh, glaucoma, when we constrict the pupil, we open up the pathways to allow the aqueous humor to flow. And so primarily the, cho the cholinergic agents like uh, pilocarpine are allowing the outflow of aqueous humor. They don't affect the volume uh, they just allow it to circulate. Uh, the cholinergic agents uh, like pilocarpine can also be used to reverse uh, midriasis and uh, cycloplegia um, of the anticholinergics or medications that are used for eye exams. Uh, side effects typically are a reduced visual acuity. Um, because of the uh, pupillary constriction caused by the med, the pupil can't adjust uh, rapidly to light changes and uh, prolonged uh, reading, anything that requires near vision, um, which would typically be uh, pupil dilation would be needed for, um, these medications cause a difficulty in. Uh, the, they can have discomfort because of the people trying to uh, dilate. Um, that discomfort typically will resolve over time. Uh, conjunctival irritation, redness will also uh, resolve with time. Um, headache as a, as a result of trying to adjust their vision. 
Uh, so because of the changes in visual acuity, we, we want to be uh, cognizant of patient safety issues. Uh, serious adverse uh, effects are uh, related to systemic uh, toxicity, um, especially if, uh, you know, if, if it's absorbed systemically. So the best way to prevent that is to block the inner canthus so that it's not absorbed systemically. You want to be aware of what the systemic uh, effects are. These are going to be uh, the cholinergic effects. So salivation, diarrhea, hypotension, uh, that's the, the things that we could um, expect. Uh, cholinesterase inhibitors um, typically act by preventing uh, acetylcholine um, from being broken down. This results in a better cholinergic activity, which uh, decreases intraocular pressure. Again, it's used to treat open angle um, or chronic uh, glaucoma. Reduced visual acuity results from uh, changes in ability to affect, to adjust to light. Um, near vision is going to be affected. Conjunctival irritation, erythema, headache, lacrimation, these are all going to be um, short term. So, you know, patients need to know that these are going to occur and that uh, they will get better with time and encourage them not to stop taking the medication or using the medication because of these effect. effect. Uh, systemic uh, adverse effects are going to be, again, those cholinergic symptoms. Typically, the uh, cholinesterase inhibitors uh, are reserved for patients who don't respond well to the cholinergic agents. Adrenergic agents, uh, dipivephrine, epinephrine borate, these medications um, cause pupil dilation. However, uh, it doesn't worsen the glaucoma because they increase the outflow of aqueous humor and even though they cause pupil dilation. They also cause vasoconstriction and that, that decrease in blood flow is going to decrease the production of aqueous humor somewhat. Uh, and then they also relax the um, ciliary muscle. So they can be used to uh, lower the intraocular pressure in, in open angle um, glaucoma. Common adverse effects uh, are related to the uh, midriasis or the pupil dilation. Again, the inability of the eye to adjust to lights. Um, so the pupils aren't going to constrict in bright light and so there'll be sensitivity. Uh, conjunctival irritation and lacrimation would uh, resolve uh, over time. Serious adverse effects would be systemic uh, if it um, is absorbed through the lacrimal duct. Uh, things like increased heart rate, dysrhythmias, hypertension, all of the things that we would get with um, stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, we could suggest that patients wear sunglasses to help with the light sensitivity. Uh, certainly they need to be aware of uh, what their heart rate is, um, how to administer it without um, getting it absorbed systemically. And then beta blockers. Uh, as used for anti-glaucoma are beneficial in that they don't have any effect on the size of the pupil. So there's little uh, blurred vision associated with it. Uh, it's thought that they reduce the production of aqueous humor. They're really not sure uh, of the exact mechanism of action. We know it's a beta blocker because it's going to end in OWAL. Uh, timolol is the um, 
most commonly used. Uh, it reduces uh, intraocular pressure with chronic open angle. Side effects are irritation and lacrimation, which typically will resolve. Um, systemic effects, lowered blood pressure, dysrhythmias, lowered heart rate, bronchospasm uh, would occur with systemic absorption. Uh, prostaglandin uh, agonists, these are things that are going to um, block the prostaglandins, which remember they cause, prostaglandins cause vasodilation, so we would get vasoconstriction. Um, they increase the outflow of aqueous humor, typically end in prost. Um, there's uh, the, the side effect. Um, one of the side effects is eye pigment changes, and um, there's actually a medication that helps grow eyelashes. That's a prostaglandin uh, agonist, um, which I think just a few minutes ago I said that it inhibits prostaglandins, and that's not what they do. Um, they promote prostaglandins. Um, anyway, back to what I was saying, um, so eye pigment changes um, may be permanent, but uh, may uh, resolve with discontinued use. Um, other uh, symptoms are going to be uh, self-resolving. Make sure that if the patient uses contact lenses that they remove them and wait 15 minutes before um, putting them back in after they use the drops. Anticholinergic agents, uh, cyclopentylate uh, or cyclogel, um, relax the smooth muscle of the ciliary body and iris to produce midriasis and cycloplegia. So Mr. midriasis is um, pupil dilation and cycloplegia is relaxation of the muscles. Uh, typically the anticholinergics are used to examine the interior of the eye uh, so that um, we can see what's going on and it might allow uh, resting of the eye uh, in inflammatory conditions and that's the cycloplegic uh, effect. There may be sensitivity to bright light again because we're causing pupil light pupillary dilation and uh, irritation and tearing, which would be short-lived. Could cause systemic adverse effects um, based on uh, an the anticholinergic effects, so flushing, dryness, blurred vision, tachycardia, retention. Um, these agents will cause an increase in intraocular pressure, so uh, that there needs to be an awareness of um, whether or not the patient has glaucoma. Treatment drugs, um, they can be cell cycle specific, <clears throat> excuse me, or cell cycle non-specific. If they're cell cycle specific, that means that they work best in a particular part of the reproductive cycle of the, of the cell, of the tumor cell, uh, they're most effective against malignancies that proliferate or grow rapidly. Cell cycle nonspecific drugs uh, are active throughout the cell cycle and are more effective against slower growing uh, neoplastic tissue. As a general rule, <coughs> more than one uh, chemotherapeutic agent uh, is going to be used um, because if we can use a cell cycle specific and a cell cycle non-specific, then we are more likely to hit the um, tumor at the appropriate time so we get uh, better success. Some of the things that 
um, patients need to know when they're on chemo agents is that they should uh, watch their linen separately from others. It's a good idea to wash them uh, twice. Uh, emphasize the prevention of complications, uh, making sure they're aware of what some of those complications are. Um, so they need to maintain good nutrition, good hydration, uh, good hygiene practices. Remember that um, chemotherapy agents don't just target tumor cells, they target anything that's rapidly growing. So this is hair, skin, um, the lining of the entire gastrointestinal tract, uh, all of these things can be affected. Uh, bone marrow. Uh, so what happens when, um, you know, we affect the bone marrow, we, we've got to do something to replace that. So we'll talk about uh, bone marrow stimulants as well. But, you know, if we're, if we're impacting the bone marrow, we have to think about what, what, is, what does patients need to know to report? What do they need to know uh, to take care of themselves? So soft bristle toothbrush, avoiding sharp objects, don't use aspirin or NSAIDs, flush the toilet two or three times. These would be some uh, safety measures. Uh, they should know that they don't have to be in pain. They don't have to experience nausea. Those things, um, you know, there's measures that we can do to alleviate those symptoms. How can they prevent, uh, protect themselves from infection? So, you know, obviously stay away from crowds or people who are sick. But we all know that there are many <clears throat> illnesses that uh, are transmitted before the person who is sick even uh, begins to have a symptom. Uh, so at times when their white count is extremely low, uh, you know, maybe they need to stay home or they need to wear a mask, uh, use gloves when they're touching items that other people <coughs> might have touched. So those are just some general things about chemotherapeutic agents. There are four primary types of uh, things that we're going to talk about. Alkylating agents, uh, anti-metabolites, natural products, and uh, anti-neoplastic antibiotics, um, hormones. So I guess that was five uh, things. Um, and then how can we help by talking about the bone marrow stimulants? So combination therapy, I already talked about that. Alkylating agents, um, this is like uh, cyclophosphamide or cytoxin is the trade name. It's a non-specific uh, cell cycle agent. Uh, it's used to treat um, many different cancers. I'm um, not really going to expect you to remember uh, what each of these types of drugs uh, treats. Uh, obviously, bone marrow depression is a serious side effect. It can also um, be nephrotoxic, so we would want to observe for symptoms. Um, make sure the patient is taking uh, two to three liters of fluid a day that their hydration status is good before treatment is started. Common side effects are going to be uh, GI symptoms, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, certainly want to watch that um, patients aren't getting dehydrated or malnourished because of the, the side effects and implement appropriate anti-emetic measures prior to the onset of the nausea. Oh, you gotta go away. I can't help you right now. Oh, I just need to do the. I know, but I'm busy. Alright. Ow. Uh, anti metabolites uh, inhibit uh, enzymes that um, allow DNA and RNA to be produced. Uh, again, they can treat multiple different types of cancers. Um, the anti-metabolites are cell-specific, um, so they kill the tumor cells at a specific time of their reproductive cycle. 
Common side effects are the same GI symptoms, anorexia, nausea, vomiting. Adverse effects, again, we're going to see bone marrow depression. Uh, we may see more in the way of dermatitis and stomatitis um, with the anti-metabolites, uh, petechiae, which would be a symptom of um, bone marrow depression as well and hepatotoxicity. Natural products, um, these are the vinca alkaloids, vincristine and vinblastine. Um, these are natural derivatives of the periwinkle plant, which is a flower. Um, they are cell cycle specific. They uh, inhibit uh, cell division by um, inhibiting mitosis. Side effects again, uh, bone marrow depression. The um, vinca alloids, alkaloids, excuse me, uh, can also cause peripheral neuropathy. Um, again, uh, if we're, we're seeing the um, numbness and tingling uh, sensations uh, in the, the hands and feet is usually where it starts. This is a symptom of neurotoxicity related to the chemo and may be an indicator that the agent needs to be changed. Hepatotoxicity is also a side of an adverse effect of the uh, natural products, um, vincristine and vinblastine. Antineoplastic antibiotics uh, bind to the DNA to prevent synthesis. Um, serious adverse effects, again, are going to be uh, bone marrow depression, hepatotoxicity, and stomatitis, and cardiotoxicity. Uh, they may also turn the urine red, cause diarrhea, and chills. So uh, these would just be things that the, they would want the healthcare provider to know that may not be uh, indications for changing or stopping the treatment. Hormones, uh, we typically, when we think of hormones, estrogens and uh, the androgens, uh, androgen uh, testosterone, but also steroid hormones uh, can be used um, as either uh, adju adjuvant therapies um, to prevent growth of the tumor if they're dependent on the estrogen or the, the, the androgen. Uh, we use the steroid hormones to reduce edema secondary to radiation. Um, temporarily reduce the inflammatory response. Serious side effects are going to include, depending on which hormone we're using um, and in what people. Uh, gynecomastia, obviously, is not going to be a problem for a female. Um, hot flashes could, could occur either one, diarrhea, pelvic pain, edema, hepatitis, thrombosis, hyperglycemia. Bone marrow stimulants um, are used to enhance the immune system during treatment. Uh, the epoetin alpha or procrit stimulates red blood cell production. So we would know that the patient needed it if their H&H uh, were low, their RBC count was low, uh, they complained of being tireder than normal, um, they were pale. Um, and then, of course, we would know that they were working um, if we saw improvement in those things. Oprelvican or Numega. Um, Numega is for uh, platelet production. Um, so how would we know a patient needed uh, Numega? 
Again, if they're experiencing easy bruising, uh, easy bleeding, coffee ground emesis, increased menstrual flow, these might be indicators that uh, platelet production is down and the patient is bleeding easily. And then filgristum is neupogen. Uh, it stimulates neutrophil um, count, which are the uh, white count, white cells. Um, decrease in white cells is going to increase the risk of infections and uh, inflammation. Uh, so um, it's important that if the patient is developing uh, frequent minor infections that the white count probably needs to be uh, checked.